people always laugh when we do stuff like this together because it looks like we're trying to do the ZZ Top thing. Um, oh, you're missing the hat. I'm missing the hat. I left it downstairs. I I realized that as we were getting started, I was like, oh no. And I didn't even shave this morning, so I've got you know the stubble here. But uh, anyway, good to have Bill with us. Uh, Bill's. <laughs> All right, you killed me. Hold on, I can't reach it because my headphones. I've got, I've got my OBU beanie back here from uh, from my college days. Um, nice. Yeah. All right. So here here's the plan. What we're gonna do is we've got a bunch of articles and recent events and stuff that we're gonna throw up and talk about. Um, if you've been through one of these, you'll you'll recognize the format. Uh, if you have ideas or questions or topics that we don't talk about. Uh, throw it out there in chat. If you're like, hey, what are you guys going to, you know, talk about this thing. I really want to know your opinion. Let us know. Um, but otherwise, we're going to get started. Um, the first one that I was, let me see how to do this. I was going to copy the um, the link into chat here. So the first one we were going to talk about is the uh, hacker returns $600 million to Poly Network and is offered a position as chief security advisor. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm conflicted. I, I, Pedro, I'm curious from your perspective as a CISO, if somebody stole six hundred million dollars from you and then gave it back, and and didn't take the half a million bounty. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he said, oh, "I'm just a good guy. I'm trying to help you." Would you hire that person? No, absolutely <laughs> not. I don't get it. I, I. I I know people play that game, like uh, Kevin Mitnick, right? He always talks about, you know, you gotta, you know, the bad guys really know how, how to do the right thing. Um, D. Paul Mass, is that just a ploy to arrest them? No, it wasn't. Like, they actually specifically said, instead of turning them over to authorities and getting getting uh, law enforcement involved. Yes. And, and my understanding, I think from the article, they offered him $500,000 and he said, no, I'm not gonna take it. And uh, <laughs> yes, Eric, we know. <laughs> um, he said, we're not, not going to take it. And then they, they like published on Twitter. They're like, we're sending it to him anyway, regardless of whether he wants it. He yep. can do with it whatever he wants. Yep. Yeah, they, <sighs> they, they said that that was supposed to be a, a, a sort of a finder's fee bounty. Yeah. And, and I'm just kind of like, okay, even if he, so, so let's assume that he was doing a, a white hat type scenario, right? He didn't really wanted to steal the coin but actually what he found out is that he couldn't he could transfer use it. He, couldn't he couldn't use it, it. Yeah. yeah right so now all of a sudden in my mind i'm like ah, just okay i can't use this i'm gonna give it back to you because i'm a nice guy and oh That's yeah good. thank you for giving us that we're gonna give you a job right yeah, yeah no yeah. Yeah. yeah that it seems suspect to me i mean uh, we're we're currently hiring people, and I've had several interviews. I've I've gone through this week, and one of the you know we we've got like four deal breaker questions that we start with from the very beginning. Like before, yeah, before you get any further, like here's the deal breaker questions, and one of them is one: can you pass a background check? Yeah. And two is: are you is it are you allowed to work in the U.S. Something like that, right? Like no, it's have you ever been convicted of a felony or something? I don't remember. Like there's lines there, HR about what we're allowed to ask, what we're not allowed to, to ask. Um, but the reason for that is we do a lot of work with big companies, financial services companies and, you know, fortune 50 enterprises. I don't, I don't, I don't know. We yeah, would I never think, hire that person, I guess. Is I, kind of what I, it comes I like down to. Eric's comment. It, it, it is, it is right on the money. If I cannot trust that individual, because this is what our business is. Our business is yeah. nothing more than trust. We are um, character matters a hundred percent. I mean, Nathan and I are are in our faces with that. If your character gets flawed somewhere, bleh, I lost my trust in you. Yep. I'm taking the keys, the, the keys of the kingdom. It, it is yep. that simple. Yeah. Somebody told me one time, if if somebody's willing to sell themselves for some amount, after that, it's just a matter of negotiation. You know, so like once once you've done it once, how do you know they're not going to do it again? Uh, I, I will uh, real quick, Bill. I wanted to clarify. Uh, so on the on the uh, big marker interface here, there is a chat section and then there's a Q and A section. If you ask in the chat section, everybody can see it. 
if you post it in the Q and A, it just comes to the presenters. So some people were getting confused a little bit about some of that stuff. Just want to let you know. Speaking of that, I'll throw it up in the chat section. <laughs> so yep. the last the last line of that article, it mentions that specifically the general philosophy is that it's better to, who better to protect the network than the person who broke into it. I <laughs> fundamentally disagree. <laughs> like, I understand the principle behind it, right? I understand. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You you want people with ability, you want people with the skill, you want people with the knowledge to protect you. Yes. But you need people with the character who have not broken into it. Yeah. Even That's, though they know how to do it. That yeah. is the professional part of professionally evil, right? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> but otherwise it's, eh, it's kinda okay, you know. Yeah. No. So there there's a Another one that I wanted to throw up here, uh, the T-Mobile stuff. T-Mobile just keeps getting banged harder and harder. Um, I'm not sure which one of these articles to, to include. I'll, I'll throw this one on here. My, uh, my issue, similar. Nathan, with T-Mobile yeah. is the sheer number of accounts. Yeah. It's, it's, how, it's, how many accounts does T-Mobile have? Well, that's that was my question. And here's what the article talks about, is that it's not only current accounts, it's all these past 100 million uh, and prior customers, holy yeah. cow! Ba basically, they said anybody who had ever applied for credit ever with T-Mobile. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the what I thought was really interesting. I mean, companies get hacked all the time, right? We get it. But but the the guy that supposedly did it, like he he published some stuff and appears yeah. to have evidence that it was him. Um, he basically said he scanned the internet, found a router, and got in. Like. Really, T-Mobile? <laughs> yeah. He, the, 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 the comment that caught my attention was this one-liner that he said, this was way too easy. This this wasn't even – I didn't even have to try. It's like, that ain't – I'm in. Yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've seen people – I've seen chatter. I don't know if this is official, and I haven't dug into it or not, um, that some of the records that were released uh, included the uh, – the MZ number, the IMSI number, and the IMEI numbers. If that's true, that concerns me because my understanding is if you've got the name, the phone number, and those two numbers, that's enough to clone the SIM and and intercept SMS transactions or uh, messages. Yeah. And if that's true, I mean, I don't know if anybody uses SMS for anything important. Uh, I logged into PayPal today earlier, and it, it required me to use SMS for... That's uh, what they use. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, come on, guys. I, I know they have other alternatives in some cases as well, but um, I don't know. We, Kevin and I argue about this a little bit. What do you, what are your guys' opinion about the security of SMS for two-factor auth? Because I know that that keeps coming up. Better than nothing, but definitely not the best thing that's out there. Yeah, I I, I probably have to agree 100% with Bill. It, it is a – and let this quantify better than nothing. It's because it is so – available so easy to use yeah it becomes the, everybody has a phone so we're like oh you already have it that and i don't have to download an app i don't have to use authy or any of the zillion authenticators that we have now it is natively use your phone number Ding, here it is yeah but the emphasis i think you put it in really plain and simple it's better than nothing yeah and I agree, uh, Vicky. The the uh, Google Authenticator, absolutely. I have four authenticators now, <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, do I need to create my own, you know, block, my own subsection of authenticators? Ah. Yeah, yeah. We we deal with that a lot with customers where this particular customer has to have this tool and this customer has to have that app, you know, to to get in, you know, to authenticate. Um, I, I do know there are places in the world where SMS really is the only option. Um, you know, Kevin uses Africa as the example of the time, but I know like uh, I, I've been to Guatemala seven or eight times. Literally, you can be up on a, the side of a volcano in Guatemala with these little Mayan women, the uh, Kachikel, that literally they know nothing about technology. They still wear the the ancient dresses and and whatnot. They carry the baskets on their head and they've got a flip phone because the phones are basically free. And it doesn't cost to receive messages. So if the local school or the government or whatever needs to contact them, they can. And they'll put like $2 worth on it. So that if they ever need to make a call in an emergency, they have it. For those type of people, SMS is their only option for, for any kind of two-factor auth. But T-Mobile, like, 
in America, I don't think that's really the case, right? Like, I feel like, I don't know. Anyway, that's that's my. I'm not saying T-Mobile. That's the issue is T-Mobile isn't using two-factor auth. But and then, and then their initial response. Well, I'm just going to give you two years of McAfee. <laughs> the the uh, protection. Yeah, 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 identity theft protection. They stole your social security number. Yes. But don't worry. I'm sure they won't wait two years to use that. Yes. Just go change your social security. No problem. It'll be easy. Yeah. Uh, Vicky said, what about Google Authenticator? Uh, yeah, that Google Authenticator works. I think uh, I, I'm a big fan of Authy. I know Pedro mentioned that earlier. There's some other options out there as well. Uh, if, if you're not familiar, the problem, my problem with Google Authenticator, the biggest uh, limitation is that it, the data is not stored anywhere else. And so if your phone, if you have to get a new phone, which people do regularly, now you have to go back and reset up every single one of those accounts. Okay. And, you know, like on mine, when I come over here to Authy, I've got one, two, three, it looks like eight lines of four. So I've got 32 different accounts set up in my, uh, like that takes a while to set up just because I got a new phone. With Authy, oh, it's more than that somewhere else. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, but, but, but you're right. Uh, so every two and a half years or three years for, for most of us, we get a new phone. Yep. He, here we go. Uh, what a nightmare. All the accounts. Yes. All the accounts. Gotta swap them over. But most of the most of the authenticator options that we have, they're not difficult to install, right? They're not difficult yeah. to use. Why not use something that's better? And it's, it, it's pe people have to be trained. Ever. It's a yeah. training thing, right? Yeah. It's user awareness and understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, all right. So this one I'm really excited to 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 see see uh CISO Pedro's response here. Um, this is kind of a long article, so I don't expect everybody to read it, but the, basically the big solar winds breach that happened last December, some of the investors have filed lawsuits and specifically named the CISO as a, uh, as a defendant. Um, what do you think about that CISO? <laughs> well, let's start with, with, I want more money, <laughs> but it, it brings a, a, a huge a huge question. So obviously legal liability, right? Corporate liability. Yep. In, in, in most of my corporate environments, usually the legal counselor is the signatory person, mm. right? It's the actual person that signs for the corporation that is literally a piece of paper. So now to flip this and say you in security is you are just as liable as the legal counselor. Holy cow. Is that is that legal counsel? Even they're not held personally responsible though, right? For what they signed for? Well, most oh, legal counselors. Well, not exactly, but most legal counselors in many corporations actually have personal liability insurance. Sure. As part of yeah. the okay, because of that? Yeah, because of that, because they are in fact the signature of that particular company. Interesting. Yeah. Now, if yeah. you look at, at professional legal, you're going to realize that there's a legal counselor, and most likely he has the signature authority. Yeah. If you got to go to court, he is the person that identifies as, even right. though you'll drag Kevin with you, but. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so. That's interesting. Sorry, yeah, go, that, ahead. go ahead. No, if, did you have something you're going to add? Well, no, it made me think of like way back when I was taking all my management classes, one of the first things that they mentioned was when you get into those positions, you have a target. If something goes bad, if something is wrong, if, if there's some sort of legal action taken, those positions are some of the first fall people, but yeah. to drop it down to that CISO level. Yeah. But I think, I think there's a difference between saying you're held responsible versus you're legally liable. Like right, to right. me, that's it. Like losing your job is one thing. Correct. Coming after yes. you for or damages, that's a totally different. Eric yes. pointed out there that litigation should be minimized by evidence of due diligence, assuming they did due diligence. Correct. Right. But even there, if it is outright negligence, I mean, if at Secure Ideas, right, we have insurance to cover if, if a consultant uh, is negligent, right? That would error, never happen because we only hire. Right. Yeah, errors and omissions, exactly. You know, our people are the best. We would never let that happen. But if it did, right. Um, Bill. But just that whole that whole liability thing. <laughs> um, I've seen yeah. similar. Yeah, I've seen similar uh, legal bills. Uh, you know, like congressional bills, and whatnot, proposing that we 
put liability for breaches and compromises on other executives. All right, the CEO, the CFO, stuff like that. I don't think I've ever seen the CISO mentioned, but I don't know. What do you guys think about that that process in general? I I haven't either, and I'm I'm very surprised, even though I already know that several CISOs have been fired when there is a breach. Mm -hmm. We are the fall guy. It's I get it. I I understand that. Yeah. And and I, I, I like your comment. There is a huge difference between legally bound versus corporate bound. Yes. Yep. That's a corporate responsibility. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think that that pushing that liability would increase people's attention? Like, would they pay more attention and be like, "Hey, we really need to do things right because I could be held liable." (laughs) You are on the cusp of a huge argument, (laughs) And, and, and a very good one. Because I'm going to tell you this much, all the CISOs that you and I know, including me, you put me in a position where you're legally liable. From this point on, we are doing things the way we're doing things and everything will be written and there will be no, ah, you know, fine, we'll we'll do that next month. Oh, hell no. We're doing that today. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We're we're, we're covering that vulnerability as soon as possible. My yeah, feeling I, is that pol- politics would skyrocket. Oh the yeah, politics, the politics and the maneuvering would yep. intensify significantly. Yeah. Well, it goes back to Pedro's point. The the uh, the price of that CISO position, you know, like they're gonna have to start paying a lot more for people to to be willing to take on that kind of. You know, it's like people always make fun of like, why does this CEO deserve you know a you know billion dollar paycheck or whatever? Um, there's a lot more to it than sometimes we think about. I'm not justifying, you know, the some of the ridiculous CEO pays, but uh, it's it's interesting how much of a cutoff there is between like yeah. CEO and CIO or, or CEO, CFO, COO, and then you drop down a little bit to CIO, and then a little bit more to CTO and CISO, and um, I think maybe it's time for I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. No, no, but I I, I think, whew, and you're right, Ed. That is a fantastic question. Sometimes yep. you're right. For, for the majority of the time, CISOs do roll uh, to a CIO role. Uh, what I have seen here lately is CISOs are becoming sort of like the the point guard person, and they are now starting to get seats at the table with the yep. executives because they they don't want to go through the CIO for the communications. So we are now becoming the chief technological officer, if you want to call it, uh, sort of like the point man. And, and so it's, it's interesting. My favorite, uh, my favorite CISO story, uh, we were doing some testing for a government agency in DC, very large, one of the larger agencies. And the, uh, it was bad. It was really bad. I mean, we found, we got domain admin access like seven or eight different ways. Um, it was ugly. And the CISO had only been there for a few months. And he brought us into his office about halfway through the week and he kind of wanted a, a, a breakdown and whatnot. And he knew things were bad, but he wanted to get an idea. And he, he gets up and he shuts the door and he comes back and he sits down and he's like, all right, here's the deal. Here's how politics works. Here's how the government works. I've only been here a little bit of time, but really my focus is on the next job. Do you think this place can be saved or should I jump ship now and move on? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been asked for career advice, advice no. from a CISO from something like that <laughs> yeah am i gonna get fired today in the afternoon or not yeah i know right <laughs> yeah yeah that's really what he was uh, that's crazy he also had a box he had a box on his on his uh shelf that was it looked like a twinkie box until you got closer and realized it said crap filled twinkies somebody had made it for him and he says he keeps that up there as a reminder of how bad the place is <laughs> oh wow yeah <laughs> oh man. yeah all right so the next one we've got on here, uh, let's see what order. I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the C Sam one first, the Apple thing. So, uh, Apple, well, did anybody, anybody want to summarize this for me? The Apple's, uh, detection of C Sam. Did you guys get a chance to read that one? Go ahead because I think that's close to your heart. Oh man. So that, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen with this one. Um, so apparently, Apple has been, they've got a CSAM for the, the child sexual abuse material detection. 
and it looks like this has been out for a while that they've been for for exchange for other types of media they've been scanning for that type, those types of attachments without telling anyone so this it kind of goes back to the other with the samsung that what other functionality do they have what other what other things are they doing like this that are not being publicized we, ha we haven't gotten to the samsung thing yet so we'll come up to that after this oh, but <laughs> we talked about, talk about it earlier sorry but, but let me let me piggyback and it, it makes me wonder if all of a sudden the the authorizations that us as consumer that we are doing now yes. click yes because i don't have a choice are right. they becoming more and more kind of in your face because you're like it said in there that i could do that and you're like I've never read that. I've never, never read that term service. Yep. Oh. Yep. Yeah. The, from the article here, it says that uh, uh, this was four days ago. Mm -hmm. Apple admitted that this CSAM detection system had been running on iCloud Mail for the last three years. So for three years, they, they've been monitoring everybody's mail for CSAM attachment. Now, part, part of the concern about the way this is happening is basically somebody generates hashes of known uh, child uh, sexual abuse pictures, right. right? It's child porn. Uh, somebody's developing these hashes, presumably the government, military, or uh, uh, law enforcement, something like that. Apple then takes those hashes, scans all of this, all of the stuff for that. Now, there's some complicated math in the way they do that and whatnot. Um, it's not just a simple hash math. But the problem is, one of the problems is, uh, one, who's generating those hashes? And yep. if, if, some government agency for some reason wanted to catch somebody find out where they are get access to their phone details any of that kind of information all they have to do is generate a hash and nobody's gonna be able to prove that it's not child porn right yeah so that's one issue the other issue is you've got collisions so maybe i send a, a picture to my wife of the new set of headphones i just got and it apple notices it you know hey this is child porn and now i'm getting a knock on my door from law enforcement you know wanting to confiscate my computer um, and then there's the whole, they're monitoring people's stuff without telling them. I don't know. I don't know, guys. You see that, uh, that the, there was a movie that came out and the, the robots are trying to identify this little pug dog and they're like, dog, pig, dog, pig, dog, pig, loaf of bread, and it breaks. That's what I think <laughs> of when it's, try, <laughs> when it's trying to, when it's trying to recognize it. But yep. there was a part on here that it mentioned. So they say that. Apple indicated that it was doing some limited scanning of other data, but wouldn't tell what it was. Ooh, I missed that. Yep. So there's a, there's a comment in there that they, they, they confirmed that they've been scanning since 2019. Yeah. They also indicated they were looking at other data, didn't say what it was. Yeah. Well, I know they, they, they talked about text messages at one point right. and supposedly this new, the, the article talks about this new tool that was developed. They plan to install it on iPhones, iPads, and Macs. That brings up a legal issue for me because I'm using a Mac right now and we use Macs for a lot of our customer stuff. So if they are right. scanning our sensitive data and we have NDAs that don't allow that to happen, there's some conflicts there legally. That, uh, that other piece makes me think of, of something that happens, uh, sexing, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Pictures back and forward with consent still, uh, could any of could some of those pictures be looked at, reviewed, checked? Yeah, um, sure. Plus, there's a rate of false false positives, and the two people who had done the research for this that a peer review article for it, they mentioned that it would be just it'd be simple to simply swap that out to a a different type of content matching database. Just yeah. swap to something else, and now what are we looking for? What are we searching for? Maybe it's not maybe it's not the CSAM. Maybe it's your political views, maybe it's your religious background, maybe it, whatever, right? Who knows what that could get into at simply the click of a, just just swap that, just swap the database out. And who would know? Because you've already accepted it. Permissions are already there. It's already on the device. Yeah. You know, now we're looking for people of one particular religious perspective or people of a certain yeah. demographic group or whatever. Um, and I mean, we're not necessarily like, we like to think, oh, the US government would never do that. It's but Apple exists outside the U.S., right? There's a lot of a lot of nations that would, and um, and the, the the other issue is, if this becomes norm, it's not just Apple doing it, right? Everybody's going to do it. Uh, Deepalm posted in the chat there. I I, I didn't know this. Uh, 
the reason people are using CSAM now, which is child sexual abuse material, is to avoid any perception that it's consensual. Uh, so instead of saying child porn, we're using CSAM. I, I don't know that that matters personally, but yeah, I, I get why people are changing that. Um, so let's pivot from there into the uh, Samsung Thank one. You. Uh, somebody, somebody summarize this while I yeah, post yeah. the so link. I'll, I'll, I'll take Samsung because th that's the one that made me <laughs> kind of cringe a little. Yeah. So um, in South Africa uh, last month, there was a huge um, unrest, looting uh, in the streets. And apparently Samsung, the corporation, has this partnership. And they have this huge warehouse. Well, the warehouse got broken into and what it looks like thousands of TVs walked all of a sudden, they just happen to be free for all. All of a sudden, Samsung is saying, oh, wait, hold on. We have a way to make those TVs unusable because we have a kill switch for any Samsung TV. When you, um, when you put this TV in the internet to get obviously content and, or to do upgrades. As a matter of fact, I say now jokingly, could you please tell me if could, could you could you shoot, could you send me the link of a TV that I want to buy that is not smart? And everybody kind of goes, Pedro, that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so it, now the question is, well, how long has this kill switch been there? What what else can I do with the switch? And then what else is embedded in Samsung this piece? Yeah. So, yeah, Deepal mentioned there, they've created a market for Samsung TV hacking. Absolutely. Yeah. Imagine yeah. as a competitor, if I could figure out, you know, compromise their internal systems and just disable all of them. So so you remember, we, you, you and I, Nathan, talked about this ransomware as a service. Yeah. yeah. I'm a competitor, I want half a million wow. dollars, go do this thing and use the block TV and kill Samsung. Yeah. Even if they even if they can re-enable it, right? Imagine the reputational damage that would well, when, when you're going to buy a TV and you say, Well, you know, last week every Samsung TV in the world quit working. Maybe I shouldn't buy a Samsung this time. <laughs> That's crazy. How, how, wow. the, the, the 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 end result, could you imagine worldwide, the end result would be just catastrophic. Yeah. From one day you are a corporation that has X, Y, and Z market share to blah. Nothing. Yeah. Three days from now, none of your stuff works. Oof. That would be horrible. A few years ago, there was a, a um, smart garage door opener. And I can't remember the brand name, but uh, it was kind of a standalone system. It had a mm -hmm. mobile app and all this kind of stuff. And it was like there was no local open, right? Or at least maybe people hadn't installed the what, whatever, but people just use their phone. They click the button on the phone. It opens the garage door and all that. Um, well, I guess the company didn't do well and went under and just shut off the servers that all those systems connected with. So all these people that didn't have a backup button, they'd never gotten around installing it or whatever. Like they just couldn't get it out of their, out of their, uh, or into their houses or whatever. Um, anyways, yeah, that just, that, that cracked me up, but. The you know, I, I what what caught my attention with that particular article after getting through, you know, what the potential impacts were is how they spin it, because they have a quote in there like, hey, this can have a positive impact on all of these different things. Look at all the good that we can do, ignoring the potential. It, it looks to be software based. Yeah. Judging from what I was reading, it looks that is a prime, like you said, a prime Samsung hacking environment. Yeah. yeah. I mean. What couldn't you do? Well, and it makes me wonder, it's like, all right, well, can that be disabled, right? Can I get in there yeah. and is it, you know, is there some software? Uh, we, we saw, uh, what was a couple of years ago? Was it Asus? Their update servers got compromised. You know, I mean, this is like prime uh, supply chain attack material, basically. Mm -hmm. Do you think, so if they're doing this for TVs, how many people have a Samsung phone? Ooh. Have they rolled out the same type of stuff? If your Samsung phone gets gets uh stolen can, can they kill it i that's a fantastic question i was under the impression they could but i'm not entirely sure yeah Which, i don't want to say yes because i'm not 
completely sure. I, I, I mean, and think about it again from a potential government abuse thing, right? If the government says like, hey, we've got these certain phones from these certain people, we want you to disable that. Yeah. I don't know. For, for legit reasons, maybe they are known traffickers. Maybe sure. they are X, Y, Z. So let's let's go with the positive spin, well, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. But 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 le legit uh, uh, business, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what makes it hard is when we make security decisions for good intentions to stop bad things from happening, but don't consider the ramifications of, you know, how it's going to affect the not bad people. You know, yeah, it, it, it's a mess. And I'm, I'm actually on an API test a lot of this week, and it makes me wonder what kind of communications are being used back and forth and what can be right. What kind of abuse can be done with those kinds of. Yeah. So, we talked about this a couple of months ago with the uh, what's the, the Amazon network from uh, ring devices and uh, Alexa. Alexa. Yes. <laughs> I, I realized as I was saying, I'm like, Oh no, shoot, stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what? <laughs> I forgot to Alexa. hit the do not disturb time. What, Alexa, what's the, play music. No, I stopped it. <laughs> Alexa, Rick Rolling. <Roman. laughs> when, when, when I first, uh, when, when Kevin first got one on his desk, we were on a call like this. And I said, Alexa, order a 50 gallon drum of lubricant. And it added it to his Amazon cart. And he's like, oh, ha, ha, ha. I don't have one click order. I can go turn it off. And I said, yeah, but now your searching um, history is, is, tainted so now like his recommendations yeah. and stuff yeah you got <laughs> lubricant off. recommendations duh yeah. <laughs> sidewalk uh thank you deep sidewalk is the uh the name of that network but it's the same kind of thing right there's good things that can happen from this and try how to just trying to balance that as a society is hard figuring out where that line is uh i'm gonna That's i'm gonna call an audible here um and I don't know if you guys have looked at this or not, but D'Angelo asked in uh, in the Q and A about the Azure Cosmos DB vulnerability. Um, uh, let's see, I'll post that I in chat. I saw it this morning, but I was not able to read the whole stuff on it. It caused me to to cringe a little because of the expansion of Azure mm -hmm. and, and, and the number of companies that I know are using Azure. Yeah. So I'm like, holy cow, this, this could be huge. The, um, yeah, basically this company found the vulnerability reported to Microsoft. The problem is in this particular case is the keys that were stolen or, or at least the keys that were accessible. Microsoft can't change them without breaking the services that are being used for those companies. And so it's one of those things, all of those companies, how, how was it? It was a lot, wasn't it? Where's the number? In my head, I saw 38,000, but I don't remember if that's how many it was. Anyway, uh, it was it was a significant number of companies. Uh, yeah, that article I don't think says. Um, I, to me, this comes back to defense in depth, right? One thing that we found organizations do not do a good job of is looking at all of the threats and, and considering, okay, what is the likelihood of this? And you know what what controls do we have in place to mitigate this? And then saying, okay, what if that control fails? What is our secondary defense? What is our detective uh, defense? What is our, you know, you know, detective, pr protective? Um, how do we respond? Stuff like that. Um, that's something the companies, as things move more and more to the cloud, as things are more integrated, we've got to do a better job of, of figuring out all of those, uh, how, how we identify threats and, and interact there. I find that a lot of them get tunnel vision. They tend to focus on one specific aspect, one focus, con not considering the whole, right? But what is the whole problem? What is the whole impact? Yep. They get tunnel vision. Yep. The, um, I don't know what I was going to say. What we know for sure is this kind of thing is going to happen again, right? There's always going to be vulnerabilities that are found. <coughs> I do like, I do like some of the, in this particular article, I do like, the mention that Microsoft actually paid um, Wiz $40,000 mm -hmm. for finding and reporting. Yep. And I truly encourage that from the Microsoft point of view because it brings things to the light that are for the good of the common, right? Um, it, it, perhaps ethically, I'm kind of like, 
you're bribing. But on the other hand, I'm like, you know what? I'll give you the bribe if you tell me if you can save, the, you know, <laughs> half a million customers from a yeah. massive headache. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, that's that's the whole. Reward. It's the it's, it's the, yeah, it's yeah. a reward. Right. It's right. the bug yeah. bounty thing, right? Yep. The, there's definitely some problems with the concept of bug bounties. There's things where it hasn't been done well. Um, yeah. But in a lot of cases, especially for larger companies that manage it well, uh, we're seeing stuff like this instead of, you know, they report it, it doesn't get fixed, and then they publish it, and now everybody's vulnerable. Yeah, Where are we at time of, Instead of give somebody 40 grand, it'll cost you way less than whatever your PR is going to be. Let's fix it. it. Yep, yep. All right, does anybody have the, uh, the Razor mouse? Oh. No, but I'm looking for one. one. If, yeah, I know, yeah. I'm going to go get one. Just now. for my security awareness, I just want to bring it out and kind of go, yeah. <laughs> <here." laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, my one of my kids had wanted one. And as soon as I saw this article, I went and I'm like, oh, man, did we get that? I, I talked him into buying a cheaper one on Amazon that was like, you know, he didn't need all the fancy widgets and whatnot. Right. He's, he's like 10. So, um, but the short version of this is, Every time you plug in a USB device, Microsoft Windows has this like repository of drivers. And so Windows identifies the device, it goes and looks in that repository and says, okay, let me download these drivers for you. If, you know, those of us that have been in IT a while, we remember back 10, 20 years ago when you had to, you know, shoot, I've got a, I've got a USB CD drive up here that it has a little CD with it, right? You got to put the CD in and, and install the drivers. Three inch yeah. CD, right? Yeah. The ones that didn't fit in half of the CD players. Yeah. You're like, crap. yeah. Um, it's multiple vendors. I have a Steel Series headset, which also is an issue. Okay, I didn't realize that. I think it's well. So I think because Steel Series, I think it's the it's the Razer Synapse software. So I think a, a number of different hardware vendors use that software. Um, but the short version is, they built software that has a vulnerability. And Windows automatically installs it when you plug in the device. Um, if I remember correctly, did either of you guys read the technical, like how it actually works? Mm -hmm. Yep. So what happens is when they when they go through to do the installation, it, it kicks off as as a system level service, awesome. and it gives you the it gives you the option to change what folder you want to install it to. When you get to that spot, if you because in Windows, when you right click, you get one set of menu op options. When you shift right click, you get your administrative menu options. You can open a PowerShell window at that spot, and now you've got system admin in a PowerShell window. You just right click and say open, you know, <laughs> prompt it. here or whatever. <laughs> because it gives you the option. It's running a system. It gives you the option to change folder. You can here's pull what, up a window. Here's service. what cracks me up. When I was in, I don't even think it was high school. When I was in junior high, so this was like 93, 94, 95, somewhere in that time frame. Windows 3.1, it might have been right when we switched to 95. I don't remember exactly the time frame, but I remember that we, our school system had this like protective shell where you can't get pat, you can use these apps and that's it, right? I use the exact same method you, you save as and then you browse to see Windows, you know, System 32, Windows, whatever, and then right click on cmd.exe and say open, and boom, now you got a shell. And then from there, you could kill the other, you know, stuff. Like, they could have hired me 30 years ago to identify, hey, here's a problem. Don't do that. It makes me wonder how much security uh, architecture is really going into stuff like this when they develop it. Well, <clears throat> go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, so I read many articles that it was faster to publish and do updates later than to fix the original code. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Publish, okay. make a publish, make a publish. And then later on, 30 days later, well, here's an update of all the other stuff. I'm still mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yeah. Escape key. I, 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 yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have no idea. I've, I'm curious about this and I don't know that either you guys would know, but if I were to create a device and I said, Hey, this is a device I'm going to sell on the market. I want to put my drivers in the Windows repository. What is that process like? Like, is that something that I can easily, I, I'm assuming they have some controls in that, but what's to stop me from getting malicious let's, drivers? Let's hope there's our controls. <laughs> right, right. Right? Yeah. Of some sort. Some sort. But because I'm just, 
I, I'm just thinking like it would be fairly trivial for me, you know, buy a Team C and do some programming and create a custom USB device that identifies as whatever. I don't know. Well, at at a at a bare minimum, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if it would or not, but at a bare minimum, if you've got a legitimate, yeah, I mean, if you've got some sort of legitimate company name, if you've got product with drivers, and it passes a basic static test, I would imagine it would probably get uploaded. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but that's my feeling about it. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, I mean, and that's always been an issue. Like, I remember there was a big hubbub years ago with uh, the folks that maintain the Debian distribution. Yeah. And one of the things they said was like all of the libraries that get submitted that get added to the repo, they're like, we don't have the resources to do security testing on all this stuff. We look at right. briefly look at the code and make sure it meets some certain requirements and certain standards. You know, we do some grep stuff to search for certain things and beyond that it gets uploaded. And so it's, it's fairly trivial for somebody that has, you know, you can buy, a library from somebody else, gain access or whatever, upload malicious code, and then boom, it gets thrown into the, so the formal distribution. It makes me wonder if we are due to do a review of all those drivers that are in all those repositories. Deep dive, because I can see a backdoor. So I, Ooh, I, 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 I've said deep this. Dive, you mean Windows Defender, right? <laughs> I, <laughs> Windows Defender has gotten really good. I, I, I'm actually not, I'm not too harsh on it anymore. They've improved a lot. Um, I've said this for years that if I were a nation state actor, right? Our government, somebody else's government, whatever. If I had virtually unlimited resources, one of the first things I would do is set up a uh, outside organization that manages software. And then I would go through and create a library a catalog, I'm sorry, a catalog of every third party library, third party software, every tool, every GitHub repo, I would keep track of what is used where and basically create a huge map of what code gets rolled up into what products. And then I would start going to all of those that are maintained by one or two people, people that have been doing it for 10 years as a labor of love. And I would say like, hey, I represent this company, uh, an Excel matrix, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say, you know, I represent this company. We really like what you're doing. We've got some resources to to do some development, investment, and, and all the things that you always wanted to do. We'll do that for you. Here's 50 grand. Thanks for all you've done for the community. And just absorb some of those libraries. And then when you get into a wartime situation or when you get in a situation where you need to use those cyber capabilities, all you got to do is upload some code here, upload some code here, upload some code here, let it all be rolled up with automatic updates, and you can do some really crazy stuff. So if I can sit here and think about that idea myself, surely that's already being done by one side or the other or all of them. So so, so I'm glad you said one side or the other, because in my mind, that's exactly what the bad guys are now starting to think. Yeah. Because they are much faster than the rest of us. <laughs> it certainly already is. So, <laughs> uh, but expanding that into the library thing. Like how trivial would it be to say, you know what, here's this off brand of mouse that nobody really ever uses. We're going to buy that company and upload our malicious code into their drivers. Yeah. And now whenever yeah. our uh, operatives are in whatever country, all they have to do is plug in this little USB device. I don't know. It's, don't, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I don't see anything that would, at the moment, I don't see anything that would either detect it or prevent it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There was one here. The uh, I think this is kind of a no brainer, but the uh, K through 12 schools facing escalating cybersecurity challenges. Uh, Pedro, I know uh, through ISSA, you and I had done some stuff with some of the local school districts and whatnot. Um, did you get a chance to look at this article? I, I, I read briefly through it, but it was a, a literally just reading what happened even to us. Yeah. And it has to an issue with resources and, yeah. and what every school system is happening today. And again, the same answer that you and I came on our small city, they are, they're, 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 they're literally just saying the same thing here. I said, guys, K through 12, don't have any money, don't have any resources. And I, and I implore those of you that are listening, get involved. G go to your K-12 and say, look, I want to help you. Uh, how can I just give you some suggestions on how to make this a little more secure? Uh, because 
literally it is our uh, students uh, education right? it just just it drives me nuts yep uh right before covid hit pedro and i and some of the others on the issa board had been meeting with one of the large well it's the the tulsa public schools um the largest district in the area and and we basically kind of approached them and said hey we want to help how can we help mm -hmm. and i think they were a little hesitant at first but overall kind of said yeah that's great let's sit down and talk and so we we met several times with their it folks and just said you know what are your what are your pain points how can we help improve that you know we had to draw the line carefully between you know we're not providing consulting services we're not selling right. you something this is right. just you know it's we not an advisory service through. Yeah, we're just having a conversation and, and they really appreciated that, you know, having security professionals there that they could say, hey, we're we've been told this. We're using this. What do you think about that? How should we do that? Um, I, I, it was really, minimum, I think. As a minimum, Nathan, it was a great bouncing wall. Uh, we even did NDAs. Yeah. Just to make sure to be that careful. we were protecting ourselves. Yeah. And, and, and it was I think the guys appreciated the, hey, we, we're doing this. Are we doing the right thing? Yeah. So this makes sense. And I remember they were they were having a different solution that we went, dude, that is really outstanding because that works. Yeah. Yeah. Eric mentions uh, reducing attack surface with VDI and, and micro segmentation. I think micro segmentation is one of those concepts that it's taking a little while to take off. I think when it does, it's going to be huge. So I'm looking at companies like Gardecore, AppGate, mm -hmm. um, Palo Alto's got one. I can't mm -hmm. remember their name. Um, these are, it's basically a host-based firewall that is managed centrally and allows you to say, you know what, this device, even though it's on the same switch as this other device, they can't see each other. They're not authorized, right? Yeah. Uh, the I, I haven't seen the SEP firewall if it's added stuff like that in there. Um, and gosh, I haven't seen Mike McAfee in a long time. But but I think all of them are starting to, it's, it's all part of the, the zero trust concept, right? Of like... Right. Not trust anybody. Let's bring as much of the uh, instead of a, a crunchy, hard outer uh, perimeter shell on the on the company. Let's bring that down to the host level. Put the endpoint detection response on the host. You know, so I don't care if your device is on the local network, you know, corporate network, or if it's at home, or if it's at Starbucks or wherever. You've got the same security controls as if you were, you know, in our old perimeter. Which with the BYOD. People bring their own dot for work or for other things. I can yep. see that easily. That could be a, a big thing, because that's that's one of the weakest points, right? Yep. When you start dealing with with your your users' individual personal machines that are on your network ac accessing your servers for the corporation, it's yeah, that's a yep. definite weak point. Yep. Um, let's see. We got a little bit of time left here. Um, the the Biden administration one. Um, Basically, President Biden met with Google, Apple, a bunch of other folks to say, hey, this is a big deal. We've got what are we going to do here? How are we going to pre prevent this? Um, I, I applaud the efforts. Uh, th there's a lot of money being spent. You know, it says Microsoft committed to invest $20 billion over the next five years. Google committed to $10 billion over the next five years. Apple Eh, we'll help supply a program. Amazon's point of view, where they said we are going to make security awareness training available for the public for free. Yeah, I like that. I like that personally. But 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 you're right. So far, a bunch of talk. Yeah. Show me the plan. Yeah, I was I was slightly confused with some of the things that because it was it was really really general, very little very little commitment other than mm -hmm. we're going to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, the the bottom here said uh, what did it say? Uh, for NIST, they were going to develop a new framework to improve security and integrity of the technology supply chain. To do so, it's going to work with other partners, Microsoft, Google, IBM. What what's the goal what's the purpose what are, what are the right what's the specific thing you're trying to accomplish because if you don't have a good goal you're not going to have a you're not going to make whatever solution is going to fit yeah yeah the um <laughs> eric said at least you guys are doing something uh to to Im increase improve this community I, I, i'm willing to give them a little bit benefit of the doubt kind of thing here and here's why 
we've had leaders in the past say, oh, this is a big deal. We need to get it. We need to do something. Um, Trump kind of took the op opposite approach and said, this isn't a big deal. Nobody ever gets hacked. You know, he talked about hackers are the 400 pound kid in the parents' basement. He said, you know, nobody gets their password stolen unless, you know, all these stupid things happen. Um, that kind of pissed me off, but <laughs> just, his password stolen. Yeah, his password was stolen at that time. The didn't dude from Netherlands who had stolen his Twitter account. He, he didn't steal his Twitter. Uh, anyways, rants. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but my point where I was going with this is, you know, Biden included the cybersecurity stuff in the uh, the cybersecurity executive order that came out. Uh, what, April, May, sometime. We talked about it on one of the previous episodes here. Um, this seems like the next step, right? They had some generalized, here's things we need to do. And we all talked about it at the time and said, okay, this sounds good. There's some general statements, some risk. Not sure how this is going to play out. We're still moving forward, right? Like now they got all of the big tech giants together and said, okay, how do we move forward? What's the next step? And so they're at least doing something. They're pledging some, they're coming up with ideas. I imagine this happened of them all sitting around a table and said, okay, what ideas do we got? What can we do? How do we improve? Yeah. We'll see how they play out. Well, Samsung already has a method for shutting things off. So <laughs> that, that, we've got one checkbox down. Yeah. A Apple's like, Hey, we, we can, uh, we can help with the monitoring. We, we've got that down. <laughs> we can leverage this piece. We're, we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, I, I liked that NIST is still pushing on the supply chain stuff. You know, part of that executive order talked about, uh, requiring S bombs, uh, the, the software bill of materials. Uh, um, I think that's a good place for NIST to fit. And I think, I hope that will work out well. Cause that's a huge problem. We've talked about libraries and all that kind of stuff already. Um, that'll be good. So, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there. Unless you want to talk about anything else. We've got just a few minutes, but, uh, I know people like to get back to stuff at the top of the hour. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Start by telling people to stop giving away password recovery security <laughs> answers disguised as quizzes and surveys. So yeah. <laughs> it, it blows me away that's still happening. Our, our boss, Kevin, did this in 2006, 2007. I don't remember. He, he does the uh, social security podcast with, uh, I can't think of his name. I I can think of his face. I can't think of the name. Yeah. Um, it, anyways, they uh, they they basically did that. They went through all of the the big banks and said, okay, what? Let, let's harvest all of their uh, password security questions. No, not John. Um, oh my gosh, I, I apologize. Go look up the social okay. social security podcast. It's not social security. It's social space security. Um, but th they. Uh, hey what they did is they took all those questions and they made a, a huge Facebook poll. Uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Paul either. Um, they, and then they put the poll out there on Facebook and it was all of the questions, you know, what was your first car? What color was your first car? What street did you grow up on? And it got shared around by so many people and people were providing all those answers and stuff. And it was part of a talk, right? They were doing research on how easy is it for people to fall for this stuff, but all right, you guys are gonna make me look it up. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm <laughs> scrolling. So anyhow, he he grabs all this data and then what? I, I don't think they did anything with it. It was just a, they put the poll out there and everybody kept sharing it and answering it. And you know how it is on Facebook, that kind of stuff kind of takes a mind of its own. But it just, it made me laugh the whole, the whole process. It makes me wonder if you can buy that data uh, because you can have, you know, a million answers and you can yeah, use I them. Mean, I imagine you could. See, yeah. If, I mean, that's part of why they have uh, dictionaries for like brute forcing. Right, right, right. Exactly. But there's there's car dictionaries, right? There there's music, there's themes, yeah, there's music movies, there's cities. There, there's all kinds of dictionaries. Tom Eston. Thank there's, you, Jeannie. Yep. <laughs> I, I kept wanting to say Tim, but I knew it wasn't Tim. But uh, Tom, Tom, uh, and um, the other guys on that show, they they still do it regularly. It's a pretty good show. They they do a lot of like a weekly thing, I think. So, all right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and wrap it up here. Uh, Pedro, Bill, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, everybody you. attending, thanks for uh, hanging out with us and thanks for the question. <laughs> Pedro is uh, more secure with his hard hat on now. <laughs> I will say, if you guys are ever in Tulsa and get a chance to tour the Grand Dam, Pedro makes a great damn tour guide. Uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun. I got a chance to do that a couple years ago and we had a blast. It was really neat. 
it's crazy. I mean, when was that built? Do you remember? Uh, 1927. Yeah. The, the size of this thing that was built almost a hundred years you, ago is incredible. You get to touch concrete that has been there for 80 years and there is, I don't know, a hundred million tons of water behind it. Yeah. And it's still there. <laughs> Yeah, I drove over it the other day, yeah. uh, a couple of weeks ago. I drove over it, and I'm like, ah. Anyway, all right, guys. Well, it's been it's been great fun. Uh, this is <laughs> Jimmy Hoff at the bottom. Yeah, I don't exactly think so. Right. <laughs> we will uh, we'll get this uploaded to YouTube in the next week or so uh, for folks to want to follow up. Um, I think Jeannie posted a link to webinars. There it goes tiny.si slash webinars. Uh, in addition to other lunch and learns, we also do a lot of other webinars. We've actually got one coming up next week. Uh, it's it's focused on Active Directory for auditors. Uh, we're working with uh, Julio Torado, who's another Tolson, uh, works for a bank here. And uh, he and uh, Eric Keen, one of our other consultants who is, I think he knows more about Active Directory than Microsoft. Um, they're gonna be doing this together on what so. auditors need to know. Oh yeah, I've often joked that uh, uh, Bill Gates created Active Directory after finding a cocktail napkin that Eric had written on the back of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, yeah, we've got one coming up uh, next Friday called Sounding Off Against Nonsense and Security. Uh, Josh Marpet and Kevin Johnson have started doing, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be monthly or what, but they, they do a lot of fun ranting together. So that's a good time. And you get free CPEs for all of it. So thanks everybody. We will uh, see you next month. Later. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye.